In the time that remains, I want us to look again. We, we took a little break last Sunday to celebrate uh, the, the steadfast love of the Lord in the light of thanksgiving. I want us to look again at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 19. What we're going to do, Doug, is we're going to go to verse 13. I would ask you to stand with me, if you would, as I read verses 13 to 19. We read 1 to 12 together. 13 to 19. Follow along, if you would, on the screen or in your Bible as I read this. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. I will tell you that spirit, the words for spirit there could be my breath prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we learn, continue to learn this so that we will maneuver in this day a great misunderstanding about this passage, that we may pray that God would give us the gift of tongues, as it's biblically stated, but avoid the snare of drifting into a tongue, as Paul makes that distinction. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we told you uh, this passage, this, this chapter, these 40 verses break down into three areas. We're just going to touch on, continue touching on the one today. The importance of tongues is secondary to prophecy. That's verses 1 to 19. And as we've been looking through this, uh, we have seen that uh, all are edified by prophecy, verses 1 to 9, that's the edification. That is the, that's one of the key reasons for the charismata, for the spiritual gifts. We've seen that already in chapter 12, 13, 9, 14. They build up. The charismata, the spiritual gifts, build up one another. They build up the church. The church is strengthened. It grows. It, it advances in its mission. And it's one of the tools the Spirit of God uses when he saves us and, and gives us the new birth so that we're born again. Part of what he plants in us, this partaker of the divine nature, is giftedness, a cluster. They may be different for different ones, but they're there in every believer to build up, to edify. So he makes the case in verses 1 to 9 that all are edified by prophecy. Verses 6 to 12 he takes the other side of the issue that tongues do not edify the church. I uh, would remind you that the way to under, understand this passage, the interpretive key, as John MacArthur points out, is in verses 2 and 4, tongue is singular. And, and further down in the passage as well, whereas verse 5, he uses the plural tongues, and that's key. The singular form indicates a counterfeited gift. It was being practiced in Corinth in a context, a cultural context, where they were familiar in the, in the, in the religious norm of Corinth to um, multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish. It was a part of the pagan uh, eros to work themselves up into a frenzy. And so he contrasts this counterfeit expression that he calls a tongue in fact, we pointed out to you before that if you have a King James Version, I think the King James says an unknown tongue. It it's substitutes that, uh, inserts that, that descriptive to let you know that there's a contrast being made. The singular is used of the faults because gibberish is singular. You can't talk about gibberishes. It's gibberish. There are no kinds of pagan ecstatic speech that qualify for tongues. But there are kinds of languages in the true gift for which the plural tongues is used. We talked about Pentecost, how on that day, this miraculous event where they all heard the apostles speaking in their language. The, the gospel was advanced on the day of Pentecost because, because language barriers were miraculously bridged. Tongues is a reference to the true gift. 
And we'll talk about an exception to this use later on in the chapter. So understand that. It's tongues, the legitimate gift, versus a tongue, a counterfeit of that gift. So tongues uh, does not edify, the, the use of a tongue does not edify the church as it's being practiced in, uh, in Corinth. We demonstrated for you a couple of weeks ago. We took a couple of my grandchildren. They came up here with their tin whistles. Is that T-I-N? Tin whistles. And played, and they played something very melodic, uh, symphonic. And then I took one of them with them. And I played, and it was not symphonic, it was, it was cacophonic, it was, it was noise. And that's what Paul's talking about, what he's getting at here. That that's what the counterfeit gift does. It just produces noise and disorder and chaos in the church. Well, so we want to get to the, this third idea today. That tongues uh, flows from emotional feelings rather than rational thoughts. That's what we looked at in verse, what we read just now from verses 13 to 19. And he's speaking, remember, when he, when he says, he says, you're so, you're so uh, desiring to practice this, he's, he's, he's mocking them in a tone of, of mockery. So he uses this singular tongue, uh, referring to the false gift, And what he's saying about tongues in this passage does, uh, does not apply to the true gift of tongues. And you've got to understand that or you're going to be led astray. You're going to think, well, Paul's talking out of both sides of his mouth here. No, he's not. He's making a very clear, very powerful point. He'd already said in chapter 12, verse 11, that the Spirit gives individually to each individual as he wills. We don't barter with him. When you were saved by grace... You were blessed, maybe in germ form. Maybe you haven't discovered it, cultivated, uh, multiplied it to use to edify the church, but it's there. If you've got God's grace, you have spiritual gifts in your life. It's the way God operates. In the pagan rites with which the Corinthians were familiar, speaking in ecstatic utterances was considered to be communing with the gods spirit to spirit. And so this is what Paul's going after. And the idea is that you bypass the mind. If I speak with my spirit, then my mind's not engaged. That's what he says in these verses. And so he's not, when he says, when someone in verse 13 speaks in a tongue, he should pray that he may interpret. If, if you're using this counterfeit gift, then there ought to be an interpretation for it. And I've told you before that sampling that, when, people, when that's been tested by the rules of language, it comes up short every time. He says in verse 14, if I pray in a tongue, the false expression of the gift, my spirit prays, my, my breath prays, I'm, I'm making noise, but my mind is unfruitful. Can you think of anything else people encourage you to practice these days where they, where they basically tell you to, to check your mind? There are some, some Eastern uh, mystical practices. The, the physical aspect of yoga is not in and of itself that, but oftentimes the Eastern mysticism that goes along with it is that, where you're taught, just let your mind go. That's the totally opposite. The scripture says, gird up your mind. Engage your mind. And so he's talking about this mentality here. He's not approving of it. He's simply taking their practice and their, and their teaching on it. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit or breath prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Well, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray also with my mind. So he says, well, I'll engage my mind. If he engages his mind by what he's teaching here, then, then the, the practice of speaking in a tongue is ruled out. Otherwise, he goes on and says, I'll, I'll sing praise with my spirit. So the, it not only included the uh, prophetic and expressive utterance in their assembly, it also included part of their praise time, their singing time, the same thing. A cacophonous gibberish. I'm not condemning people who practice this in different places. Uh, that falls on their teachers. They're simply practicing what they've been taught is the reality. He says in verse 16, otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, the idea there is only without engaging the mind, 
How can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? That's just a rational understanding. We're told in the scripture that we're, we're two or three are gathered together. We're to pray in, in the name of the Lord. He will hear. We can say amen on Wednesday nights we do this. So, you know, all who have a comfort level to pray aloud, please do so so that we can enter into that with you. We can say amen, so be it. We agree with you. Paul is taking that principle there and saying that the way you practice tongues in Corinth doesn't even allow that. How can anyone say amen when they don't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough. He said, you, you, that may be your intention. You may be absolutely convinced that in the, in the multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish that you're expressing, that you're thanking God. But the other person is not being built up. And there again, that's the measure. Is, is my embracing and practice of this spiritual gift edifying the body of Christ? And then he says, and watch this, I thank God that I speak in tongues, plural, and I, and I practice the gift, which seems to be, and I'm not going to limit this because I, I pretend that I, I've captured all of the mind of God on this, that seems to be an expressive uh, approach to sharing the gospel in a way that to people who have not heretofore heard it that it bridges that gap miraculously. I speak in tongues more than all of you. He did not say, I speak in a tongue, that I practice what you're practicing. No, he said, I speak in tongues, plural, more than all of you. And then he brings the evangelical uh, hammer down. Nevertheless. This section remembers about how Paul asserts that prophecy that is, speaking in a way that other people understand, prophecy, is superior to the practice of tongues. The speaking forth intelligible, rational words is more valuable than, than practicing multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish. I would rather speak five words with my mind. You see how he's using that there? Again, he's teaching that the, what's being practiced in Corinth, and sadly what's being practiced in many places today is a, is a opening of the mouth and sounds coming out where the mind is not engaged. He's going to build upon this throughout this chapter when he says, when something like this happens in Corinth, there must be an interpreter. There must be somebody who can take what's happened and communicate it in rational, intelligent speech to put a check on what's happening there. I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others. Instruction, by the way, is part of edification. If you've taught someone something, taught them truth, our Sunday school teachers gather every week with, with people in those classes and we're teaching truth, we're building one another up. Truth is never to be just a fascination. Ooh, that was neat. I hadn't, no. It is to be received and, and worked in so that I'm changed. I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. That the truth sets you free. I would rather speak five words with my mind, prophesy in order to instruct others, than 10,000 words in a tongue. And notice how he's used the singular. The verse previous, he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But if when it comes down to the value of the charismata, of the spiritual gifts for the building up of the body, five words that fall under the heading of prophecy, prophesying, not, not so much in our day foretelling, but always forthtelling, five words forthtelling. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's more than five, but that's a strong message is worth more than 10,000 words that going on and on. And you get the picture of what he's saying here. That it seems to be reaching a, a, a feverish pitch. There's no shortage of this expression in Corinth. In fact, the word here for 10,000 is the word 
that we get our term myriad from than to speak myriads of words in a tongue, a tongue, the false practice of the gift of tongues in the church at Corinth. So what do we learn from this? Well, first of all, we ought to be committed, as Brother Norman said earlier, to speaking five words about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the answer to this is not to be silent. The answer is a new commitment to speak forth the gospel in a way that other people can hear it and receive it. In other words, in their language. When our Haitian friends come and Pastor Denny stands in this pulpit to preach, it'll be an awesome thing for him and for us. But if Pastor Joseph isn't next to him, interpreting, it will not be an edifying experience. So Paul has pretty well set the bar, and we are to be committed to what he calls us to, the exhortation to speak five words with our minds engaged, the truth of the gospel, and to avoid the snare of getting caught up in, in uh, long sessions of multisyllable, non-intelligible gibberish. We're to pray for our friends and perhaps family whom we know who, who are caught up in this. They're not bad people. They're just misguided by their teachers. Pray for their teachers. Their teachers are probably not bad people. They've just been misguided. If it could happen, brothers and sisters, in a church that Paul himself had founded in Corinth, it can happen anywhere. So our response is not to look down our noses and and. and make fun. and all. No, no. We pray. We pray. And then we practice. Because we're not any help to them at all if we ourselves are not speaking intelligible language about the gospel. If we're not putting the premium on it, if they're not, they're not around us hearing us share the gospel, rejoice in the gospel, build one another up in the gospel, then we're, all we become is, is disdainful critics to point out the error of what's the common practice of tongues today. See, it's all about the gospel. That's what it was for Paul. And Paul basically says, and I'm going to close with this, you're not, you're not declaring the gospel. People don't understand. Only if there's an interpreter who can say, well, those, that, those sounds just are saying this. He said, if that's not present, then it's not the gospel has nothing to do with the gospel. Our God's a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. Our God spoke plainly through the prophets, through Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, through the apostles in the New Testament. He spoke plainly. And we must be committed to that. And never think that something other than that can fall into a legitimate category of declaring the gospel are advancing the gospel because it's all about the message of Jesus Christ who came as Bethlehem's babe, grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, burst on the scene for a public ministry where his first words were a call to repent, repent, turn from your sin for the kingdom of heaven has come among you, who lived a perfect life of perfect obedience to the law of God who in the fullness of time offered himself up to die in my place and your place, bearing in his body our sin, enduring God's wrath upon him for sin, dying, abandoned by God, raised three days later from the grave, vindicating all that he said he was going to do, all that he said about himself, rising on high, prepared to take with him everyone who will hear and receive this message, the gospel. So my call to you today is repent. Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And don't look for some signs. The only sign we're going to get is the sign of Jonah. He was in the belly of the great fish three days, spit out alive after the end of that. Jesus died 
rose again. That's your sign. And I challenge you to respond to that sign today and be saved. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ again. We, Lord, forgive us when we want the phenomenal and when we want the fantastic and, and help us to be content to see the gospel as you presented it, to hear the gospel as it's been declared, to not look for ecstatic experiences, but to look for a saving encounter with Jesus Christ with a purpose that when, when we become followers of Christ, that we will take up his name with friends and family and neighbors and enemies and speak plainly to them, clearly to them, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That Jesus Christ is God's Son and Savior. Help us to pray for our friends and family who, who have been caught up in arenas where this gift is distorted, perverted, counterfeited. And we pray that you would help us to live and speak such compelling lives before them that they would fall in love with Jesus and the simplicity of his gospel. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing before we...